And now we move on to our next session, which is involving the future in the present. Uh, indeed, a very interesting session is, is about the role of children in animal rights advocacy. And our moderator for this session is Paul Littlefair. He is the head of international of the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, RSPCA, UK. Paul graduated in Chinese studying and working in Asia before joining the RSPCA in 1998. He has collaborated with organizations across the region in many areas, development of anti-cruelty law in China, inspectorate training in Japan, Taiwan, and Hong Kong, farm animal welfare standards, welfare and, ethic and ethics with several Asian national laboratory animal sciences associations and animal welfare education in a number of countries. Paul, it's a pleasure to have you today with us. Very and uh, I also see you have uh, all the panelists eagerly, uh, all the speakers rather eagerly awaiting to come online and start the session. Over to you, Paul. Thank you. All right. Many thanks for that, that warm introduction. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, it's a it's, a, it's early in the morning for me, but it, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, so uh, this second, second panel of our conference is uh, involving the future in the present, role of children in animal rights advocacy, as we've just heard. We have a lineup of four speakers who are going to talk about their work in, in Nepal, in Vietnam, in India, and in China and Pakistan. And uh, I'm sure you'll welcome uh, them with as much warmth uh, as we have just heard now. Um, our first speaker is Angela Shrestha. She's the founder and program director of the project Humane Nepal. And the topic of her uh, presentation this morning, this uh, morning, afternoon, evening, whenever you're watching, is uh, strategies for effectively teaching in-class humane education programs. Um, her presentation aims to look into tips and techniques utilized to deliver effective in-class education programming to make the younger generation empathetic and aware of, knowledgeable about, and empowered to make changes in their attitudes and behaviors regarding humane treatment of animals. So thank you very much, Angela. Um, welcome, and uh, we look forward to hearing your presentation. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much for signing up for this session. My name is Angela. That's me in the photo with uh, little Dobby. I found Dobby on the streets in Kathmandu, Nepal last year during the COVID lockdown. Unfortunately, there are too many dogs and puppies like Dobby who live on the street and they live such a difficult life. They live in fear almost every day because they receive a lot of uh, abuse and cruelty from the community. So in order to be able to break that cycle of fear and abuse, to encourage empathy and compassion in the community, to inspire action uh, through our organization, Project Human Nepal, uh, we, have been in a, we have initiated and we've been conducting presentations and workshops in schools to educate, inspire, and empower the young generation to make a positive uh, difference in the lives of animals around them. In 2019 alone, uh, we were able to provide humane education workshops to more than 23,000 students in schools. And it's not just about, it's not about the numbers, it's not the quantity, uh, but our main focus as educators was to improve the knowledge, uh, the attitude and intended behaviors of the kids regarding humane treatment of uh, street dogs as well as pet dogs. When we evaluated our program, the findings suggested that more than 92% of the class enjoyed our presentation. They said that they learned something very new, something meaningful that they hadn't learned in any other classes. And the most promising and the most exciting part was to see the shift um, in the perception of the kids uh, from negative to positive about how they anticipated treating the dogs on the street and at home. So in the next slides, I'm going to talk about, um, you know, the different strategies to uh, 
conduct an impactful and effective educational program in a classroom-based setting. So these two strategies that I'm going to talk about, both are research-based, and uh, they're going to be relevant when you're going to teach a group of kids who are um, middle school kids or um, kids from high school or even college goers. And uh, these are going to be relevant when you teach about um, any topics related with animal welfare, be it about companion animals or even about you know, farmed animal welfare. So these are very general strategies. Um, so tip number one, include a lot of visual stories in your presentation. By visuals, I mean um, powerful videos and images or photos that are relevant, of course, and that present um, accurate and factual information. Um, when you show videos and um, photos um, in, in classes, they sort of take the attention of uh, the kids and you know it helps you connect and engage the students as well. And also um, telling stories about the experience of animals, regarding animals as individuals and not just you know a part of a species. Uh, it really enga engages the kids and helps students connect with the life of the animals as well. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, for instance, this is one of the slides that we use during our classroom presentation. Instead of just putting out a text saying, you know, put out a bowl of water for animals in your neighborhood or feed them, um, we try to pass on that message through um, visuals like this one. So this is a story of a mother dog. After she gave birth to a puppy, a few people from the neighborhood made a makeshift uh, shelter for her and provided some food and water. And when we show these, uh, show this picture to the kids, um, the kids have written in their post-class notes that, uh, you know, it's, it, it has sort of like touched them and uh, the photo sort of remains with the kids and has inspired a lot of kids to do something for the animals as well. And we also share a lot of uh, before and after photos and stories of animals that have been adopted, that have been rescued. Uh, and this is one such story, the story of Olive. So Olive was born on the street uh, along with uh, seven of her siblings. Um, after her mom gave birth to them, when she went to find food, she was hit by a vehicle and then she died. Unfortunately, this is the fate of a lot of mother dogs in Nepal. And so these were basically orphans. And uh, we knew that, you know, if the puppies continue to live in this condition, they probably wouldn't have made it. So um, this was the day when Olive and a few of her siblings were rescued from the street. Fortunately, two of them got adopted into a, a local family. And again, you know, adoption of uh, the dogs on the street, bringing them home from the street is a completely new, it's not a very, um, it's a very new thing here in Nepal and it's something not in the culture. Um, so we're trying to bring about a change in the perception of a lot of people about you know, um, adoption. So um, in the next few slides, you'll see how um, Olive's life completely was transformed after she got adopted into this family and how the life of a dog can change when they receive you know, love and care from humans. Um, so this is Olive after a week, after getting adopted. Uh, and, you know, kids have been really surprised, you know, when they see these pictures, you know, uh, of her life on the street versus when, you know, the dogs are treated as a family member as opposed to, you know, being regarded as pests, just pests. So uh, this is Olive growing up. Uh, this was probably in 2017. Um, Olive turns four this May. And this is her now. Um, <clears throat> when we show these pictures, um, the children don't only really talk about Olive or they don't only really have questions about her, but they even notice the dog that's behind Olive, and that is Raju. Uh, Raju used to be a street dog too. Um, so, you know, so this is uh, pictures and, you know, videos can really, really be impactful. And um, this was Olive's first Kukur Tihar, uh, the day where, you know, the entire country worships and celebrates dogs. But for Olive and Raju, every day is a Kukur Tihar. Uh, but they do, you know, like to get pampered and spoiled <laughs> once in a while. Um, 
so these are some of the testimonials that kids have written about um, our presentations, about our workshops. And these kind of shows how impactful videos and photos can be and how they can change um, the perception of, of the kids about a certain idea or a topic. So one of the kids is, uh, have writ has written that um, he or she was inspired by the videos. They really liked Olive and our brother Raju's story um, and if given a chance, they too would adopt a dog. Another child writes that seeing the before and after life of Olive and Raju was life changing for them. They've learned to love dogs and to care for them. They're thankful um, to Project Team in Nepal for showing beautiful and heart touching videos. So this is the impact. Um, moving on to the second tip, teaching with passion. So. Uh, when you're passionate about a cause and when you teach about it, you know, to a group of kids, I think it, it reflects when you teach. The kids can, um, you know, tell, can see your passion, can see your enthusiasm. And in return, they too um, get very motivated and driven to do something um, for the animals. Um, not just that, but um, in 2015, um, I did a research where I interviewed about 10 humane educators. And one thing, one sentiment that was common, common among all these educators was, you know, their passion about helping animals and their passion about educating the kids about the same. And they too said that um, when you teach, you know, with sincerity, when you're genuine about a cause, it sort of reflects when you teach. And it sort of passes on to the audience as well. And that sort of makes the project really, really impactful. Um, so yes, um, you know, being passionate about a cause, being sincere and genuine does make a huge difference. And not just that, it's just not about, um, you know, teaching, but it's also about how you teach. So the body language of the educator, um, the words that you use, you know, all these have the power to either encourage or uh, discourage empathy among the audience. So, uh, you know, the two strategies that I shared, well, it's just not limited to these two strategies, but there are so many other creative ways to go about um, when you, you know, want to effectively um, um, teach about animal welfare in a classroom setting. Um, I think the one thing that all of us really have to be mindful is about, um, you know, it, it should suit, um, you, the strategies need to be um, age appropriate. Um, so yeah, if you have any other questions or if you'd like to further know about our work, this is uh, my contact information. Again, thank you so much for your time. Um, hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Angela Schist from uh, Project Humane Nepal. Really interesting to hear uh, turning the sort of individual stories of street dogs uh, into something that children will find fascinating and, and develop empathy around. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, can I just remind people who are viewing now live that if you'd like to ask a question, if you put your auditorium screen uh, on the left, you see two tabs. One is the agenda tab, and below that, there's ask a question tab. So if you'd like to ask one, please, by all means, uh, type in your question there, and we will come to it at the end of this session. Thank you. So let me turn now to our second speaker. Uh, our second speaker is Mrs. Mai Nguyen. She's from Humane Society International in Vietnam. Uh, she's a wildlife program manager. And uh, my presentation shares uh, children-focused demand reduction campaigns implemented in Vietnam since 2013 to tackle illegal wildlife trade. Uh, the National Curricular Initiative uh, aims to teach children about species conservation and threats in the hope of instilling the next generation of Vietnamese citizens with an appreciation of wildlife, uh, leading to a decline in consumption of products such as rhino horn, ivory and tiger bone. Thank you, Mainyan. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank Paul for your introduction. I'm so glad today to share with you all about our Humane Society International Children Focus Demand Reduction Campaign in Vietnam. My presentation includes three main parts. The first is quite the 
profile of dynamic consumer of wildlife products. Why the second we say with you the reason why the advocate um, we advocate children rather than other in this target group to reduce the demand. And finally, I would like to highlight some outstanding achievement of our demand deduction campaign. Funny, as some of you may know that Vietnam is known as a short transit and destination country of wildlife products due to its convenience of geographic location. So to combat wildlife crime, our HAI project in Vietnam focusing in three main periods, including fully reforming law and re regulation to narrow down of the loophole that wildlife crime you. Secondly, improving law enforcement. And last but not least, the demand reduction implementation. Before devising our strategy, HDI team in partnership with Vietnam Scientist Management Authority conducted a bayline survey in 2013 in order to understand motivation of buyer and user of wildlife product. Some grew up for the project team to develop potential strategies were gathered from research results as follow. As you can see in the left hand side, only 4.2 of red pollen admitted that they had bought and or you rhino horn and other wildlife products. Continue interviewing in deep these people, a drop of profile of consumer could be demanded as mentioned in the hand, uh, in the right hand side. They live in six big city across Vietnam, Nai Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City. More than 30 years old, their income is more than 1,500 US donors per month. Only a small portion of the consumer were aware of their illegal activity. Successful business people or high-ranking government officers are strongly believed to account for the measure of consumer and the blind belief on medicinal benefits and leveraging their social status are two main reasons why they have you or bought rhino horn and or wildlife production. Understand the insight of the consumer. Head and I empower government partner to conduct multi faces a government-led advocacy strategy beside of communicating directly with immediate target audience such as business communities, traditional medicine practitioner and human association across Vietnam. Head and I start preaching school students from primary school to high school and some university students to raise awareness before urging them joining hand to change behavior. As you can see in the lab graph, it takes several steps for a person from observing a problem to change their attitude perception and be belief before taking suitable action to fix the problem. Our principle to choose a different advocacy approach are simple as almost of how how in Vietnam have school age children and in our culture, children is central family. To the concept convene Earth is that by educating one child, many other people in their child life would receive the campaign message. Another reason is that considering that child might be potential future wildlife product consumer, he and I strongly believe that each child that receives the campaign message may be one less future adult consumer that would buy or consume wildlife product. As such, HDI and our government partner didn't invest 
own resources for immediate Turkish audience. We diversify our target audience, as you can see in this slide. Uh, with that growth in mind, we prepare, develop many visualized and easily understandable communication material in both English and Vietnamese, such as a 16 page book for primary school, namely Am Rhino, Amita Rhino. Uh, which were distributed to almost 2 million Vietnamese children uh, across the country and a series of four 10 million cartoon video Amnita Rhino, Tiger, Pangolin, and Elephant, as you can see in this slide. The movie will aim more than 100 times in national and provincial television channel and many social platforms. If you are interested in the content of the movie, feel free to go ahead to the YouTube to search. Besides of the national, uh, national level, the campaign came directly into six hotspots provincial as shown in the first Bayline survey to arrange many provincial and school communication events such as role play, drawing competition, English speaking contests, and so on. The event focus on wildlife conservation, threat to the wildlife, particularly endangered species, and how school and university students can join hand to break protect the species to avoid the uh, extinction. It is great to say with you that by end of 2016, our campaign has reached an estimate of 36 million people, about one third of Vietnam popula population. Following success from the first phase uh, in the second phase from 2016, to 2019, I continue paying attention in the primary school students who are from six to 11 years old. We believe that this is a prime time for children to learn about human war, where animals are loved and treated respectfully. As you can see that we have experienced more than two years to complete the curriculum from conducting the first assessment on the actual demand through our drafting, piloting, consultation, many revision and peer reviewing. Finally, the curriculum was approved by Ministry of Education and Training in December 2019. It's a big pleasure for our project team that Vietnam government committed commit to include the extra curriculum in the education system at least in 10 Turkish province known as hotspot of wildlife trafficking or consumption from the school year 2019 and 2020. Uh, have a look at this slide. In the left-hand side, so the guidebook designed for teacher why in the middle are uh, nine different books are uh, designed for students with interactive activity from basic concepts such as why, domestic animal, ecosystem, ocean, forest, and so on. Threat to wildlife and feasible solution to protect species. The right hand are communication material supporting for the learning in class. HDI is proud that curriculum on threatened species have reached up to more than 2 million students only in one school year by end of 2020. By teaching school students, we hope that the next generations of Vietnam citizens with an appreciation for wildlife will take full responsibilities to save animals in any form. 
it is too early to conclude that this approach might be better than other demand reduction initiatives. But based on the theory of social behavior change, we strongly believe that Headed R and our government partner are working so hard to contribute to the progress of making a social movement, a social change in which all citizens feel their responsibility to protect wildlife and endangered species. This is um, come to my end. And thank you very much for listening. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much, much. Uh, my uh, from, from uh, HSI in Vietnam, Vietnam Main Society, Society International. Really, really interesting. interesting. Of course, a lot of countries across the Asian region you know um, wildlife consumption is very, it can, can be very high, and uh, it's vital work reaching very young people. Uh, trying to find out what, what adults' consumption habits are first, and then targeting young children, the next generation, who hopefully will, will turn away from those kinds of products. Thank you very much, Mr. Nguyen, for that. Um, I'll just remind everyone again about the question box. Uh, ask a question that appears at the, on the left-hand side of your auditorium screen if you come out of the large screen. Uh, and uh, we will come back to questions at the end. Thank you. Uh, now let me turn to our third speaker of the panel, uh, our third speaker is Vasanti Kumar. She's a co-founder and managing trustee of Straw India, and she describes uh, her, her work and presentation. Uh, our motto is animal welfare through education. Uh, we sow seeds of compassion in school children of today so that they, as doers, influencers, opinion leaders, and decision makers of tomorrow, are encouraged to become ambassadors of change for a better world for the voiceless. Thank, Thank you very much, much Vasanti Kumar. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, AFA, for giving me this opportunity to speak at your esteemed conference. I am truly honored. My topic for today is children, the biggest hope for animal rights advocacy. All of us at Straw believe that children are the biggest hope for animal advocacy. You may wonder why. Our reasons are three. Children have a natural attraction for animals. Children are the easiest to convince. And the world becomes what we teach. At the same time, when it comes to older people, we have a problem. They are very difficult to be convinced. In fact, they flow against the rhythm of nature. Let's call these people disruptors. They have problems with everything, trees to flowers to beehives, cats and dogs. Take the case of this picture here. It's a beautiful tree with beautiful flowers. But when the flowers fall down, they fall, fall with a thud and people don't like it. It dirties their compound, they say. So the solution to that, chop the tree. Take the case of this beehive. Our tall buildings, have reached to the level where the beehives are very close to us. This picture was taken from my window on the third floor. The people want the beehives to be brought down because they disturb them at night, being attracted to the light inside their houses. Then of course we have the, the cute little puppies. People would like to dislocate them and do away with them. So this is a problem with everything that they have. We also have people who are unaware, ignorant, and silent. In the case of this lady here in this picture, she's a gardener who comes to her park every day to tend the trees and the plants. And a little boy walks with her and he is busy playing with ants. The other day I saw him killing the ants, told him what he was doing. And he says, I'm playing with the ants. And I'm gonna explain to him that he's actually killing the ants he understood, he stopped, and he also went to the extent of saying sorry. Then we have the third category of people. They're very few in number. We, let's call them enhancers. They move with the rhythm of nature. They inspire people to be compassionate to all living beings. And they even nudge children towards developing kindness and empathy for animals. 
Here's when Straw's role comes in. Straw is striving to play the role of a multiplier of enhancers. We are trying to increase the numbers. Our motto is animal welfare through education. Our work is sowing seeds of compassion in little children. And our motivation is Dr. Mandela, Nelson Mandela saying, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. To this, we have added three little words, humane right at the beginning and four animals at the end. So now it will read like this. Humane education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world for animals. What do we do? We do what is known as compassionate classroom programs. We do it for school children and for college students. And for school children, we have compassionate classrooms and compassionate scholars for college. This was before the pandemic. Once the pandemic came, we moved on to the online mode. We call them stories of kindness. And for college students, we call it kindness dialogues. For school students, we've been teaching them subjects like each one can take care of one stray animal, how to celebrate Diwali in a possum manner without crackers, busting myths about cats and no more cages and chains. And the case of uh, the college students, we've been doing, uh, creating animal friendly campuses First aid for animals, inspiring them to avoid elephant rides, and also inspiring them to avoid uh, using horses during weddings. We have created a lot of uh, humane education and animal welfare education resources. They have been particularly made for Indian circumstances. There's a lot of information available on the internet, which is for other countries for their circumstances. We have created contents that is for India. We have classroom activities, worksheets for homework, drawing outlines, coloring sheets, PowerPoint presentations, and quizzes and puzzles. Children are our biggest hope for animal rights advocacy. You, you may wonder why we say this. We call this the ripple effect. Let me explain. When we do a compassionate classroom program, we inspire children. Children discuss it with their parents. They also discuss it with their siblings and with friends. And then they have actually become the future generation uh, where we have actually sown the seeds for a future generation. And if we, if we get lucky, these children can also be inspiring their own kids to be compassionate. We have worked out a little math for the ripple effect. Teaching one child is equal to teaching five children, five people. For example, it is like they talk to two parents. They let's say they talk to one sibling and maybe two friends. So it's equal to five people. So when a teacher is teaching a class of 50 children, she's actually inspiring 50 children. And the message of compassion is actually spread to about 250 people. Here are some pictures of what work we have done. This picture relates to when we had taken a dog to classrooms where the children come and touch the uh, dog or the puppy and they actually get over their fear of dogs. We also take, we have taken a dog for a first aid session at IIT Delhi. We also done it at DTU. Uh, and we've been doing many drawing programs and the outdoor activities. And at colleges also, we have been doing some um, inspirational work. We urge all people who love animals and children to begin humane and animal welfare education classes in your own neighborhoods. Because it doesn't take much, it doesn't need a large space. It doesn't need much money either. All it needs is a passionate heart that beats for animals, fluency in English, fluency in the local language, and a strong drive. I'd like to leave you with a video clip of what children take home when they come and participate in our programs.
Let me play this for you. I will see you with the message of the story. In this story, there are two messages. First, we should keep our nature clean. Second, we should treat all living creatures with kindness. Thanks. Yes, um, my, uh, my favorite animal is a rabbit because they're so cute. And to protect them, I don't really want them to go in cages because then they just stay locked up for the whole time. So if they're just free, they can happily move around. That's why I really want a rabbit as my pet. Like, and, like us, animals should also be free and not be caged. The message. Thank you. My favorite animal is one peacock because it's colorful and the national animal of India. Okay. And Miki, can you tell me how can we look after the peacock? We can set her free. That's why we say that children are therefore the biggest hope for our long-term animal adv advocacy. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, um, Kumar, for your presentation. That's very interesting. And uh, I'm beginning to detect a, a common thread through our presentations. Uh, around empathy and around, especially just now we heard about the, the impact of multiplying uh, of children being able to influence the, their family members and their friends, people around them. And, uh, and that's an important factor in, in the education work that we're trying to do as animal advocates. For our fourth speaker and the last of our panel, uh, again, I'll just remind you before uh, that if you want to ask a question, please use the tab on the left of your screen uh, if you're looking at the auditorium screen. For our fourth speaker, um, I'm very happy to uh, introduce a, an old friend of mine. We've known each other more than maybe 20 years or so. Um, this is uh, Pei Fan Su, uh, who's the founder and the CEO of Act Asia, uh, an organization that's been working particularly in China, but other parts of the continent too. And uh, her topic is an introduction to uh, the program Caring for Life for Children. Uh, Caring for Life Education for Children is Act Asia's unique six year curriculum and guiding resources for primary settings in China and also in Pakistan. It's based on the UNESCO's four pillars of education, promotes social and animal welfare and environmental issues through more than 3,000 trained teachers, uh, which has reached more than 100,000 children so far. Thank, Thank you very, very much, much. Uh, Pei Fan. Welcome. Hi, everyone. I'm Pei. I'm the founder and CEO of the Act Asia. I would like to use this opportunity to thank FIAPO and Blue Cross of India to invite me to speak at Asia for Annual Conference 2021. Today, I would like to talk to you about Act Asia's caring for life children education in Asia. Agdesia was established in 2006, and we have offices in United Kingdom, in United States, Netherlands, and Australia. We also have two offices in Shanghai and Zhuhai. We're very happy and very pleased to um, celebrate our 15 years of anniversary in this year as well. In today's world, we are facing enormous global challenges, that's including human suffering, animal exploitation, and nature crisis. These issues are all interconnected. Instead of fighting the fire constantly, um, Actasia believe education is a way to address root causes. And before I talk about why um, children's education is really important for animals movement, I will use to, I would like to use 2021 Harbin Polar Base Hotel, which is located in Northern China, Harbin um, in uh, Heilongjiang province. And you may already have heard these two, these two bears was confined in the courtyard of the hotel. And so everyone gets, uh, every guest and uh, hotel, Guess they could um, 
when they stay in this hotel, they can um, see the polar bears. The slogan the um, hotel has used is called Sleeping with the Bears to attract more visitors. Um, you can see from this photo is a very a great attraction for the kids um, to visit this hotel, to stay in a hotel or have a dine, dine uh, or to uh, dine in this hotel. And the girl on the left also show how happy she was to visit this um, place. But the sad thing we can see from this picture is that children are not seeing the animals as you know to show their nature behavior. They see the confinement. They see it is okay um, to you know confine animal in such an environment. So when the you know what they are doing is they nature behaviors and needs of the animals the welfare are all being neglected and compromised. So kids are growing up to see this is okay when to treat animals in such a way. So through the generations, they are not easy for us to change their behavior. So it turned out to be we are treating the, you know, the court, we're treating the issue without address the fundamental challenges. And you can see from the hotel, the next door is the exhibition for more uh, North Pole, South Pole animals like this penguin and girls can, uh, little children can feed these animals as well. So what we are trying to do is prevent these kids to grow up to see this is the kind of activity they want to see. They truly from when they are young age, they understand animals are sentient, any animals are having feeling like humans, animals, their needs and care should be met. Um, so what Agdesha tried to promote is we know many groups are trying to do what they can during their, you know, the, the, the annual program with more burning issue. However, education, it should be addressed when the kids are still very young, early stage. Um, so education is not being seen as an add-on program. It should be, you know, taking more serious consideration and taking more strategic approach to address these issues as well. Agdesha's um, children's education program started in 2012. It's based on these course um, for pillars of education. And um, we teach uh, the kids from six to 12 years old and um, they we run the course in the state school, not just in the private school or international school. We train teachers to teach the course. And what we are trying to teach is human education to compassion and empathy towards animal is a, a proper subject rather than just be seen as a ad, um, ad hoc talk. And so it's 10 lessons per, per year for six years of learning as well. And um, we train the teacher to teach the course rather than act Asia staff to uh, deliver the, this um, program. We're very pleased uh, today we have the um, we have a have done almost 10 years of efforts and uh, we have a great outcome achieved is we have trained more than 3000 educators and we met, we have reached more than 100 students 100,000 students within China. Um, in, within this program is also very important. We have independent researchers to evaluate our program. So you can see we have the result to, uh, to show in the academic journal and the research um, being um, evaluated, our course have been started since 2013 um, to date. And um, so you can see we have a very solid data about how kids have changed their behavior through you know, the program. They become nicer and kinder to each other. Their attitude towards animals was 34%, you know, the understanding better and be before and after the lesson. So the change, we can show this solid data. And we are very pleased you know, to share with you is through our um, programs and from beginning in 2012, we started how we researched the education system to implement the project. Today, we have a set of supporting material 
for when we continue, when we approach the school, um, we have uh, caring for life educations, a curriculum standard, curriculum guidelines. We also have evaluation um, results to share with them. On the right hand side here, you can see we have 60 years of lesson plan in English. And the bottom here, we have six years of lesson plan in Chinese. And so that is all allowed the uh, teachers they pick up the lesson plan can teach year after year. So you can see here is a six years of lesson plan. We also have um, the uh, language in Greek and also we have the, the material being translated to in same um, language in Pakistan. And I would like to show this um, very short video about how the teachers um, in Shanghai um, to share with your view about what she think of the Caring for Life Education course. Hi, so You can see from the feedback we receive from the teacher, she has you know, taught the course in the school for more than three years. She's not only um, delivered to the children by themselves, they, the teacher themselves also receive the, the feel the change with their view to view their society, the view the animals, their relationship with animals, their view our relationship with nature. So the course itself is not just go to school to say what is right, what is wrong, what is what we are wanting to stop. It's actually in front of the kids to make the informed choice. They grow up to say, I do not want to see this polar bear to be confined in this hotel. We do not want to see the the animal to be used for the entertainment, for the performers. They will want to stop to buying the products made from the wildlife and from the illegal wildlife trade. Hi. Um, as I mentioned earlier, so we're very pleased the course is now being introduced to Pakistan in one of the same province. And um, we will have three years pilot program with them. That's also the research will start at the same time as well. And the, the, the pictures here just show the, the core, the lesson plan have been translated to the um, they, um, same language. And really the final things that I want to share with us is we know we all have a burning issues. We all have a, a direct rescue. We have to work in our you know, own organizations. We have lots of animals need to be rescued. However, is that is important, but education can also not wait. We need to address the root cause and hopefully by working together, educate the next generation, we will create a more compassionate society for human animals and all together. And I hope if any of you are interested in our Caring for Life um, children education in six years of learning, please do contact us and by uh, writing to us or contact um, through or look at through our uh, website. Thank you very much. And please do welcome to ask me more questions later. Thank you. Um. 
very interesting to hear how Actasia's program has uh, constructed around uh, UNESCO guidance and also the, the sustainable development goals as well. These are kind of universal things that we know everyone can can uh, sign up to if you like. Um, I'm just checking uh, to see if questions are coming through. In the meantime, I have a few of my own. I think that I uh, that I thought of. Uh, I think really pull together some of the themes that we've been hearing about. So my first question, and I want to ask everyone in turn, we have a bit of time uh, before our end session ends. Um, obviously, it, there are very few countries in the world, maybe there aren't any actually, that have animal welfare education or, or, or certainly animal rights, for example, um, in the formal curriculum. Uh, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious, curious as, to, uh, as to how the panellists think about uh, how to uh, counter that challenge. If it's not in the formal curriculum, teachers very often will say, well, you know, we have enough pressure to teach the national curriculum. Um, that's the requirement as teachers. The Ministry of Education requires us to do these things. Uh, there were examinations at certain ages for children around these topics. And animal welfare, welfare doesn't fit into this. Um, how are we supposed to, to cover this? Uh, I'd, I'd like to ask the panelists, panelists in turn, perhaps. perhaps. Um, uh, uh, Angela, uh, Angela, would you, would you like, like to start? Sure. Um, so, so, yes, um, answering, answering your question, your question so, so every time, time we've conducted the main education programs program in schools, uh, we, we also request the school administration and the teachers to sit through the session, session because for most of them, them it's their first time, um, you, you know, uh, getting, getting to know about um, learning, learning about the different topics related to, let's say, companion animal, animal welfare, welfare in our case. And um, initially, uh, because, you know, if it's their one, first time, um, first time sitting through, through a presentation, they were very skeptical in the beginning because they've never been educated by someone else on companion animal, animal welfare issues. issues. But after, after the presentation, they've been pleasantly surprised, and a lot of teachers and school authorities have been interested to help. Um, you know, they've been interested and they've requested us to sort of help them integrate um, these issues, rega issues regarding dog welfare issues like rabies or responsible pet ownership. Uh, you, um, you know, know into, into their, their regular, regular curriculum, curriculum and, and um, it, it can, can be blended and integrated into the longer term curriculum and many uh, through, through different subjects, be it through, you know, English, English or science or general curriculum, character education. education. So, so I, I think you've kind of be, you, I think it, it, it also depends, depends a lot on like how you persuade the school authorities, how you make things easy for um, the, the teachers as well. Like you mentioned, they already have a lot uh, to, to complete, complete in their end too, especially since, you know, COVID, COVID happened last year. Uh, so, so I think, you know, um, one, one thing at a time and um, um, one, one little change at a time, time that's, that's, that's how I'd like to put it, it. yeah. Thank, Thank you, you, Angela. Uh, my, my, did, you did you hear the question? question? I, I understand you have a connection, connection problem. problem. Yeah. I'm trying to debate, but my connection is unstable. Okay. Um, so, so the, the question, question was simply just, as, as we know that, that, you know, for example, wildlife protection is not really in the national curriculum, um, and, and teachers have a lot of pressure on them to teach other things or the things they have to teach. So how, how do we uh, work with teachers to, to try to cover topics that may be seen as extra? additional or outside the formal, the formal requirements. Yeah, that's very true in Vietnam because in, in our education system, there are so many themes that cover head to 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 much literature or English, something like that. But the, the Teaching, teaching the education, the education uh, um, um, about, about the about the wildlife environmental environmental um, protection is a uh, topic, and the way we are working with a, a teacher to inspire them to feel that that is the compulsory uh, topic. So. 
because when talking about the illegal wildlife trade, uh, illegal wildlife crime, so uh, and how people become more aggressive the day and make problem like the environmental pollution. The grassroots problem is that the loss of connection between people and wildlife and animal. So the way developing uh, the curriculum to feel that, okay, interactive, uh, meaningful curriculum when we see and also <laughs> curriculum both ministry of education and training and the teacher feel very interested to join our project. And even the project and they still call for the technology, have them uh, provide extra training for teacher and student. That all from my end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mai. Um, Vasant Kumar, can you, can you add something to the discussion? Yeah. Yes, I, uh, I like to add what uh, Mai was talking about, getting into the curriculum. Thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, in India uh, also, it's... Yes. Uh, yeah. I'm just... Uh, uh, I like to say that getting into... The curriculum part is a very difficult part in India because um, the government's the education department is extremely close with what they have and it is a lot of hard work and but yes when they do come up with the book to publish at that time if we are to get in touch with them and we can add a few things like what we have done uh, the Centre Board of Secondary Education, we were able to contribute a few lessons. Uh, over 16 lessons we, uh, we contributed in terms of empathy and compassion. So, um, yes, we can do that. And that's the Centre Board. There's also the State Education Boards. We have to get in touch with them and uh, keep following up with them. And there is a possibility, but yes, it's tough. But I think one on one with schools is a good. One on one with schools is a good idea to contact schools, and, and I think in the recent past, uh, schools are also becoming quite uh, sensitive about this matter. And uh, in fact, a few schools called us to come and do programs for them relating to animal welfare. So I think that is a positive step forward. Yes. Thank you. Very and much. we will have to firstly come in for a quick uh, second. I think someone has switched on two mics. I, I think that's um, why yeah, we maybe has two. Echo. Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you for switching it off. Thank you. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Right. Um, I think we're, are we coming into our last five minutes now? Is that right? I think so. Yes. Yes, thank you. Oh, we have time for, we have time for Kate to mind. answer answer the question that I put earlier, the challenge of uh, trying to fit animal welfare or animal welfare education into a, into a full curriculum? Of course, I think the, the, the question um, Paul mentioned here is very important, but I think it is our lifetime mission. There is no quick fix. Um, to enable us to get into the curriculum, we need to be able to demonstrate the strong case and I think we have made some people as a community itself. First of all, is we need to remember uh, schools are not our education, uh, it's not our campaign ground. It's very, very often when we go to school, we want to say, don't do this, don't do that, straight, stop straight animal issues, stop, you know, buying this, stop that. And um, we've got to think if the authority think we are coming to campaign, what about they facing about the human rights issue, labor issue? So we got to be understand education is non-judgmental, is for making the kids to learn informed choice. So it's a knowledge base. So we need to be able to demonstrate a very broad um, foundation about what we're teaching is, could be part of science, is nature science or social science. We need to come with 
the professional expertise and educational expertise rather than what we think animal how animals should be treated so i think you know just be mindful to really think about from the school's point of view education point of view rather than what we want you to hear i think we need to really as an educator we need to understand the their perception, what do they have already know and what made them don't want to accept it? What is their worries? We often not to think about that. The other thing I think, you know, we need to really emphasize animal welfare is science. Animal sentience are the science background and um, can back us up. It's not just because we are compassionate individuals or compassionate organizations. And I think lastly is the, the data, we need, you know, and also I think the data and also what are the teachers, their burdens? You know, if we have many experience when we talk to the, the teachers, when we actually explain to them is about respect, compassion, empathy, they can relate it to because they see the problem. So you, I think at the beginning, to enable to reach to the higher education or to, not higher education, to reach the government as a curriculum, we need to mind, find our partners. We need to find more people like us. They want to make change through education. So I think that's a very a few um, very key um, points we need to address it when we want to promote to the bigger audience or to the national as a part of national curriculum. Thank you very much, Pei, that's excellent. We have one more minute. So I'm going to ask everyone to be 10, 15 seconds, a quick tip. A question from the audience, um, parents, what do we do about potential resistance from parents or reluctance from parents to, be, uh, to have their children uh, educated in this way? Very quickly around the room. Uh, can we start with Angela, please? Oh, sure. So we've luckily, fortunately, <clears throat> we've not had any resistance from the side of the parents. But the kids have written and mentioned about that um, in their feedback form that even though if I, let's say, if they want to adopt a dog from the street, they would face resistance from the parents. Um, so we always give the kids take home materials and we've got some notes for the parents as well. And we've been trying to you know, conduct sessions, community sessions with the parents as well on the request of the kids. A very valid question. Thank you, Angela. Very good, very quick, very snappy. Mai, do you have any suggestions, additional things? Yes, we do have some feedback from children, parents, about that, okay, they do that, okay, they, even they love their children, but they think, okay, they, what is not uh, something reliable. I'm happy. I've, uh, from, I've had assistance from parents. The parents have been really encouraging. But in one or two circumstances, the principal of the school has allowed us to go and do a program. But then I, I had teachers who said that, uh, why are you coming and wasting our time? Why are you coming and uh, influencing our children uh, to, to do things? And they've also said things like, please make sure that your programs don't uh, contribute to our children stopping to drink milk. They have said that. Right. Thank you, Vasanti. Milk is a very, uh, you know, it's a very important part of one's diet. Oh, yes, yeah. Hey, thank you. La last, uh, last word to you, Pei. Um, like I said, we have a school working as, with us as a partner. The principal, the teacher, they buy into your course. They then feel they need the support from the parents. So in all the school we have promoted, we've, we have additional uh, programs called uh, Parent Power Talks. So we will pass on the information to explain to the school about what, uh, to the parents about what their kids have learned. And we ask them to be part of the change. They can up report back to the school as well what they have seen the change with in their children. So the school, again, they welcome that because the school often feel the pressure from parents is enormous. So if you bring have some entry point for them to work together, again, the school feel you reduce their problems. So everyone working together as a team rather than in isolation and complain about each other. And I think we need to find that key points to how to bring them in 
is they that key could be the compassion and empathy and the compassion and empathy to to animals will benefit to human and then they get it because we have to remember lots of people in the part of the world we're in in Asia they have very little understanding about animal welfare. They are even frightened of the issue. So we got to bring something to make them feel, I want to do this together with you. And I think parents is important, but we need to do step by step. We don't go to parents by ourselves. We got invited because the school want you to come to talk to the parents. Then you got a great entry point and to talk to them and you bring everyone together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pei. That's a lovely summing up, I think, involving people, um, letting them see the value of what we're trying to do. But it's got a much wider value. It's not just about treating animals well. There's a, there's a deep uh, human, human compassion, empathy message as well that benefits society. Thank you so much to all of our four speakers today. Really interesting topics from slightly different angles and countries. Um, uh, we've run over a little bit, but I think we're forgiven for all the, the tech challenges that we all have in our respective places. Many thanks, everyone. I've enjoyed this morning very much, uh, and I look forward to watching it all back again later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. You've been a fantastic moderator. And uh, Angela, Mai, Vasanthi, and Pei, such wonderful inputs. And I Art of this holistic uh, approach uh, 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 engaged in. And thank you all about what you do. So I hope uh, that you remain joined with us today for the entire day and enjoy the other sessions. Paul, a big thank you once again to you for the excellent uh, moderation, despite all the technical challenges and these fantastic speakers that we have. So uh, have a wonderful day.